Preston, good to see you again, and welcome to the show. Great to be back, Jimmy. How are you doing? I, I, I'm doing well. Um, I'm, I'm trying to make sense of the world at the moment because it's, it's getting kind of confusing, isn't it? Well, I would describe the, uh, the situation as the erosion of trust globally. Mm, mm. Um, are you familiar with uh, Stephen Covey? You really uh, yeah, the, the seven habits guy, of highly right? successful people. Yeah. So oh. his son, his son wrote a book uh, also mm. by the name Stephen Covey. Mm. Uh, he wrote a book called The Speed of Trust. Mm. And the thesis in the book, it's actually a really good book. Um, but the main thesis, if, if I'm remembering right, uh, it's been a few years since I've read it, but um, the main thesis in the book is that as trust erodes, cost goes up. And as, mm. as trust between participants uh, is, is high, costs go down. Mm. And um, if we were looking at the, at the global lens of cooperation, you know, pre-COVID, I would say you were, you were at peak cooperation globally where everybody was just in time uh, manufacturing and uh, people thought that in that no matter how much they printed inflation was going to continue to go down and that we would actually have uh, debt markets that would be negative yielding like that's how insane everything got at that pinnacle of what I would say was global cooperation and trust amongst each other uh, I, I, I think that pendulum has definitely started to swing the other way. And I think the momentum of that is going to pick up pace. And so you might be asking, so like, what is driving that swing mm. in the pendulum? Right. And what it really is, is it's the money. So, um, and we've been talking about it for so long, but <laughs> like, if I, if I'm really going to get into it, um, aggressively, I would say leading up to COVID, the the foundation for finance is the treasury market is the U.S. Uh, bond treasury market, hmm. and anybody who held a bond for those forty years leading up to COVID, right? The value of it always appreciated because the yields were always compressing lower. Okay, you can you can zoom way out. You can look at a, a forty year chart of of interest rates for any duration bond. You could say a 30 year bond, a 10 year bond, doesn't matter which, which you, uh, duration that bond would be. But every one of them, the yields were going down for 40 years straight leading up to COVID, okay? Mm -hmm. So if the, the global cooperation that's happening around the world and people are getting paid in dollars, which means then they convert that into treasuries because they wanna collect yield on the dollar, if the value of those are constantly going up for 40 years straight, the entire planet has no issue with that being the settlement layer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Following COVID, all of a sudden, uh, why, did, why did Russia invade Ukraine? Mm -hmm. we, I mean, that is a giant macro or geopolitic uh, conversation. But if I was going to summarize it into a sentence, it was NATO continued to expand uh, to the east, uh, there was agreements in the 90s that that wasn't going to happen. And it not just happened, but it aggressively happened. Mm -hmm. um, and when you look at the, com the commodities that are being sold between NATO countries and non-NATO countries, there's a really interesting dynamic when you pull the thread on that. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the dynamic is, one is a net producer and the other is a net consumer, okay? The net consumer is all your NATO countries, right? If you look at all the products that they produce on a net basis, they consume more than they, than they export. Hmm. On the non-NATO countries, they export more than they consume, okay? So when you look at this relationship, and if I'm really gonna break it down at a really simple and basic level, when you have, like, let's just say it's, it's you and me, Jimmy, mm -hmm. and let's say you're consuming more than you're, than you're giving back to me. And me, on the other hand, I'm giving more than I am uh, receiving back from you. In that relationship, there's a balance of payment that has to happen that will net flow to me because I'm providing more in that, in that exchange, okay? Mm -hmm. So let's say you come to me and you say, I still want to consume more than I give back to you, but mm -hmm. 
but I want to pay you with literally monopoly money or, <laughs> or shrew bucks. I want to pay you with shrew bucks from the office, right? Mm. They're, they're, you, you would say to me, I promise you, Preston, they're, they're good. I'm good for it. They're shrew bucks. There's nothing stronger mm. than a shrew buck, right? <laughs> well, I'm having to perform real work to deliver real things to you to consume. Yeah whether that's oil, whether that's food, whether it's you name it, piece and part material, like real physical things I'm delivering to you. And you're saying, Preston, I'm just going to pay you back in these shroop bucks. I promise these babies are good. Uh, for the last 40 years, they've always appreciated these shroop bucks have always appreciated in value, right? Hmm. This is the dynamic that's happening in the world right now. And in that scenario, the, the net producers are all these BRICS countries, every one of them, okay? The net consumers are all the NATO countries that, that want to pay them in their shrew bucks, okay? That's what's happening in the world right now. And you get to a point where when the shrew bucks aren't going up in value anymore, which is the U.S. Treasury market and all other NATO uh, Treasury markets, when the value of that is as the savings because they're net producers, they're 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 stacking these shrew bucks and they're putting them off to the side, right? When when that breaks down, all of a sudden things turn physical, is mm -hmm. as in physical violence, <laughs> okay? Because these people are doing real work with their hands and muscles in order to extract whatever it is that they're supplying to the other side, to the other counterparty. And the other counterparty saying, I'm going to pay you in these, in these fictitious paper nothings that are going to get radically debased. They can do the math. It's, it's that's a going back to the Greg Foss meme, right? They can do the math. They don't like the math. And, and why do you think, Jimmy, when, and I'm not trying to promote Russia, I served in the U.S. military. Mm -hmm. I believe in the U.S., like what we, what we stand for culturally, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to pit one thing versus the other, but what I am describing is going back to this idea of an erosion of trust. And when trust breaks down, prices go up. If I was going to illustrate that idea really simply for you, mm -hmm. imagine going to the airport. And let's just say everybody trusts each other to get on the plane and you're not going to go hijack a plane and fly it into a building or do something stupid with it. Well, you don't need people to check your bags. You don't need all these, all these issues. I, well, that was pretty neat. I just saw a little thumbs up come up on the video. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you don't need all of these additional security measures that you have to pay for because there's not a lot of trust in that relationship. Okay, but let's say I'm very worried about people getting on a plane and all these other things. Now I have to increase all these security measures and and the trust is is down. The cost is up. Okay, mm -hmm. and so we're watching a global erosion of trust between net producers and net consumers. Hmm. Well, so you're 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 talking essentially about all the friction that uh that transactions have to have when you lack trust and mm -hmm. um and you know the the part that's really interesting to me is that sometimes it erupts in violence when that trust is sort of uh violated can you uh talk to us a little bit more about what that lack of trust i i guess uh theft from one side to the other how how that erupts in violence and how that ends up costing even more money to everybody that's right so um, when, when we pull back the thread on how governments uh, interact with each other from a monetary standpoint, from an energy exchange standpoint, because that's effectively what this is, is they're exchanging energy with each other. Hmm. Well, we've never had a money that has been trustless based on trustless technology. That's, that's Bitcoin. Everybody that's hmm. listening to your show understands that that's the innovation is it's trustless money. So if, when we're to the left of that event of this new technology inserting itself, everybody was using gold as this foundational layer. But the, the issue that so many Bitcoiners understand is that that technology of gold and paper units on top of it, the reason the paper units are on top of it is because the gold isn't saleable in a way that's easily exchanged between counterparties. 
Okay. So that's, that's how paper currency arises to this. This is where you interject why violence is, is so closely associated with gold and pa the paper units that ride on top of gold as, uh, as a representation of that unit. Okay. So you and I, now we're governments. Let's say I'm government A, you're government B, and um, I, you know, we have a difference in in how we're trading with each other. And you're saying I think you're cheating over there, Preston. <laughs> I think you're paying me with with these paper units that are actually getting debased, but you're telling me that they're not, because the only way you can actually audit that is based off of me telling you what the audit trail is, right? Like you can't come in there and like round up all these paper units and say, well, let me, let me see your gold vaults. Let me make sure you haven't put lead in the middle of the bars. Let me make sure like all of these things, right? It all, because that money required trust, it opens itself to the country manipulating the currency so that they don't have to go to the citizens to say, I want to go, uh, argue and fight with Jimmy because I think he has done something unethical over there and I think he's doing X, Y, or Z, right? So you're able to tax immediately through the debasement of that paper currency hmm. to fund whatever short-term interest that you have at a long-term expense. Hmm. Now, governments can do this in a productive way and they can do it in an unproductive way. But I know in my personal life, individually, when I'm making a short-term decision at a long-term expense, it is almost always a bad decision, <laughs> right? It's like, mm -hmm. do I go into the kitchen and scoop off some ice cream here at 10 o'clock in the morning and enjoy myself a nice ice cream at the expense of my long-term health? Mm. It's a bad decision. It doesn't mean that it wouldn't be an enjoyable decision for <laughs> the, the five minutes that it would take for me to plow through that, but... Uh, you know, like that's what we're really up against. And so fiat that rides, uh, well, I guess it wouldn't be considered fiat if you're actually on a gold standard, but, uh, what it does is it incentivizes you to never be able to actually keep the peg is because you tap into that and you continue to, de to debase it and you don't replenish the ratio that you had before through taxation. Instead, you just let it ride and you keep doing it. And once you stuck your hand in the cookie jar and you didn't get caught, then you do it another five times. And next thing you know, you break your gold peg, which is which has happened with 100% certainty throughout <laughs> time. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is the incentives of fiat and a gold peg and why I, uh, I guess I speak so harshly about gold from a sovereign standpoint. And I want to emphasize that from a sovereign standpoint, I speak very ill of gold because gold is setting society up to be only duped yet again. Hmm. Okay. Gold at the individual level has somewhat protected buying power over time. Um, I, you could look at like how the ratio has changed as the, the monetary premium has changed over like the last 40, 50 years. It has, it has been annihilated over like the last 40 years, as far as the monetary premium on gold. And that's why I guess I phrase it the way I do with respect to, um, gold, uh, retaining its monetary premium and retaining your buying power. But from a sovereign level, if I'm a country and I'm using that as my backbone for finance, you are guaranteed based on a hundred percent proof of work throughout history that it will fail <laughs> and that humans will continue to exercise their, their human nature and tap into it and destroy it and, and cause severe pain for everybody in, inside of that country. Hmm. So I, I think what you're saying then is that with international trade and this sort of like bad money, whether, you know, it's like a gold substitute or, or fiat currency as, as uh, it's currently being used, you have the ability to not even tax your own citizens, but tax other countries through the debasement of the currency. And that causes um, a breakdown of trust. And that in turn means that 
there's that violence becomes an option to sort of get some justice or something like that. Is that, yes. is that an accurate summation? It, and it doesn't start off with violence, but that's where mm -hmm. it ends, right? Mm -hmm. Because as you start going down this, this path of, I stuck my hand in the cookie jar and I didn't get mm -hmm. caught. I debased a little bit, but I've started to erode at the ledger. And then you do it again. The problem is, is this isn't linear. This is exponential, the way that it plays out. And so as you get to the tail end of this, in order to keep the Ponzi scheme going, you, you realize that it's like a fire pit, right? As the fire pit gets larger, you're not putting one log in because you're, dealing, you're not dealing with a linear amount of space, you're dealing with an area, which is the length times the width. Hmm. So it's not putting one log on the fire, you're now having to put five logs on the fire, and then you're having to put 25 logs on the fire is how this unfolds as you start to break that peg. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that's what, uh, I think humans in general have an extremely difficult time understanding exponentials. And I think that's one of the reasons that a lot of people have a hard time understanding Bitcoin um, is because a lot of this is playing out in an exponential kind of way and not in a linear kind of way. So, so Preston, I, I, I'm trying to, understand where what where this leads and uh and you know according to what you're saying essentially the u.s has screwed over all of these BRICS countries the producing countries through the debasement of the currency and they're starting to recognize it and this has erupted somewhat in violence uh particularly in ukraine and perhaps even with iran and what's going on in israel right now I mean, uh, if what you're saying or if the incentives that you're saying is what actually leads to violence, then like, are, are we going to get way more violence as a result? Because the the debasement hasn't really stopped. The inflation continues and we're still having to um, deal with the after effects of all the money printing that we've been doing the last three years. So in the short term, yes. Yeah, trust is going to continue to uh, un, un, you know erode. Um, I would I would just reframe the net producers versus net consumer thing just a little bit. For the last forty years, it's worked really well for everybody for the for the most part. Uh, I think Alex Gladstein would say it definitely hasn't for a, for a lot of nation states. But in general, it worked well enough that people weren't willing to turn to physical violence to. Uh, to seek retribution for feeling unjust, okay? You're now at that phase in this cycle where the amount of debasement that they're having to do is getting into the hockey stick part of the curve. And um, everybody knows that uh, what they have to do next is unprecedented uh, further debasement in the next round. And the last thing they wanna do is be holding that those toxic units, the treasury bonds and NATO uh, credit, right? Mm -hmm. So um, because of that, the world is desperately searching for what is going to be the new settlement layer. And, uh, you know, like the BRICS nations, they, uh, you know, at their summits right now, they're just saying, oh, well, we just need to exchange in our currencies and accept our currencies and then everything will be fine because we control that ledger and we just need to get off the dollar and we need to get off euros and we need to get off these NATO uh, paper currencies because we're going to get destroyed for all this physical stuff that we're delivering in exchange for these paper units. Um, mm -hmm. If the U.S. continues in in Europe and all the other NATO participants, and I'm using NATO because it's just easier for me to kind of describe mm -hmm. the the one side versus the other side in in this uh, global situation that's playing out, uh, it's it's much more nuanced than that. But generically speaking, um, as you as we continue to go down that path, the harder that the net consumers push back and say, mm -hmm. "No, we're going to jam this dollar down your throat." I think the the more uh, headbutting and physical violence that this is going to to turn to, and where it's it's going to get crazy is there, and you're starting to see some of this play out. We're like, well, we're just we're not going to produce at the levels that we used to. You're starting to see this with Saudi Arabia, which I, you know, the petrodollar system is completely based <laughs> on this relationship between the dollar and Saudi Arabia. You're seeing uh, religion uh, work its way into this. I'm not going to cover that because it's going to totally polarize uh, the audience. 
Um, most people can't even entertain that conversation because it's so emotional. Hmm. Um, but uh, I would just simply uh, describe that uh, to just get simple with it, right? As that trust erodes, you start off with arguments, you start off with policies, you the, the, you migrate towards uh, intangible fighting, which I would describe as like the way that they they took the uh, the Russian reserves back, mm -hmm. the SWIFT system, like all of that is intangible war, mm -hmm. and then it's then it slowly articulates and moves towards physical violence. Now, here's where I'm very hopeful for the future uh, with all of this, because it might sound like I'm just a massive pessimist and, you know, warmonger or whatever. And, and it's totally not. I'm actually extremely optimistic for the future, because for the first time in human history, we have a uh, technology that can actually bridge the gap between what I would describe was legacy technology that will always result in physical violence. Okay, we actually have hope this time around for the very first time in human history that depending on who's in charge and depending on uh, how much influence they wield with the buying power that backs them, the faster that they migrate to Bitcoin as a solution, the faster we can as a global human race move away from physical violence and uh that's a that's a beyond exciting uh almost divine thing for our lifetime to to experience and um here i'll wait for a second <laughs> you got Sorry a lot of excitement that. going on <laughs> I, I think something's happening with the dog but yeah <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, no, 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 no. Going. So, so I, I, I want people to realize that. So, how can we usher in this new technology so that we can have the most uh, beneficial outcome for all human participants in the system? Hmm. The only thing I can say is it's education. I lost you, Jimmy. Okay, you're back. Uh, yeah. To, to foot stomp the, the point, it's, it's education, right? Mm -hmm. Education is the only thing that we can do to put these ideas into people's heads that there is a fairer way to exchange energy with each other. Mm -hmm. There is a fair way to exchange energy that you don't even have to worry about the counterparty doing these fancy things that benefit themselves at the expense of everybody else in the system. And, um, you know, some there's there's a lot of people that that are looking at what's playing out right now with a very pessimistic point of view. And, you know, I don't want to sugarcoat anything that that potential outcome can happen. But what else can happen is we can help educate key decision makers that 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 run these massive, huge countries and, and domains and if they actually wrap their head around what this actually represents, we can maybe sidestep what history has showed us is inevitable to what would come next, which is physical violence. And I think that, that it's totally in the realm of possible to sidestep it. Yeah, so the, the physical violence, though, in, in a sense, when, when you have uh, the ability to essentially steal from the other uh, person it, is... In a sense, I guess what you're saying, uh, an inevitability and whether you sort of wrap it in religious language or something else, it, it, it ultimately results in violence because people are angry that stuff has been taken away from them. Um, and well, it, and, it's and interesting that you. Yeah, go ahead. I would I would say the reason that it that it ultimately arrives at physical violence, going back to the idea of exponentials to keep the Ponzi scheme going at the end is a total impairment of credit markets okay it's it's not uh like you're just debasing them five percent and it's and they can kind of deal with it they don't like it but they can kind of deal with it when you get to the end of this of this curve you're you're literally accepting physical goods and what you're getting in exchange is zero okay that's why it leads to physical violence because if i come to your house jimmy and I destroy the whole place, light it on fire, and I say, well, 
that's your problem, right? <laughs> like you're going to be pretty dang angry. And, and most people, maybe not you, but most people are going to seek revenge and they're going to seek physical revenge for what was done to them. And that's, that's why it leads to physical violence because in that reset, which is a debt Jubilee is everybody who owned that debt, it goes to zero because the currency explodes. And at that point, uh, your, your property has been, or all your work, all your energy, all, all that you put into it has been just sort of taken away from you. Yes. So um, uh, I, I, I think I see this hopeful world ahead that, that you're talking about, but how do these current um, like conflicts end? Because there doesn't seem to be that much of an appetite on any side to uh, for peace, uh, for for um, resolution, and that that's something I don't know. As a libertarian, I, I've been very discouraged about. Is you know, I mean, everyone wants blood, uh, and I, I don't know. Perhaps that comes from sort of uh, uh, you know thinking about the property that you've lost or something like that. But how how do you get people off of that and and start establishing peace again? Um, I think that in the uh, very short term, the coming year, it's extraordinarily difficult just because of the momentum and the trend that's behind a lot of this, right? Uh, not to mention the education gap of what you would move to to build instead of destroy, uh, I think still has a whole lot of room for uh, improvement or understanding. I, we're not even close to uh, key decision makers being able to fully wrap their head around what this is. And another piece of it too is if you are on the receiving end of feeling like you've been ripped off for a decade or or more um some people are they're much more focused on the retribution than they are of finding a solution and moving forward and that's again human nature and that's not anything that anybody can actually control when you're looking at it from like a, a sovereign standpoint on an individual standpoint sure it's easier to influence because it's much smaller it's like controlling a speedboat versus a, a cruise liner um so uh, i think those are the challenges i think in the coming year you're going to see things uh not improve but um you know hopefully if if bitcoin and I think one of the biggest instructors of Bitcoin, and I hate to say that, is just price action. Like, mm. if Bitcoin rips through a new all-time high, people see it go to a hundred, two hundred thousand. Um, it's it's probably one of the best professors on the street to say, "Hey, uh, how are you denominating your money? Are you keeping it in dollars? Because if you are, this thing right here just kind of ripped its head off, um, and you might want to reconsider how you're thinking about what money is." Uh, so, you know, I. I don't know what that looks like. I'm very bullish 12 months from now with respect to where Bitcoin's going to be. Um, and uh, I think that that's going to be quite the, the instructional lesson for not just the U.S., but everywhere in the world as to what people are going to want to retain their buying power in. Um, because you're starting to get to the point where it died three times before. It's been around for more than a decade uh, mm -hmm. type scenario uh you got black rock and fidelity saying that they recommend people hold this in their portfolio and and they're not the governments aren't going to shut it down at this point it's it's very obvious that they're not going to shut it down i don't know what that was, <laughs> I, don't <laughs> that was kind of I don't know where that's coming from by the way i have no idea uh, and neither do i um so uh I think those are things that are going to potentially make the the coming uh, you know bull market a little different than what we've seen historically because uh, it's kind of gotten to the point where it's all growing up and it's a little difficult to ignore at this point. Um, and I just hope that the right people that are in the right key positions from like a sovereign level actually take notice and, and start to consider it as their new uh, uh, bedrock of the financial the global financial system. Yeah, uh, something something that you mentioned before about sort of uh, how how a lot of countries are slowing down production of the goods and services that they 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 offer. Um, do do you see that changing anytime soon? Because in in a sense, you you're talking about 
you know, places like Saudi Arabia that are slowing down production of oil as a, you know, way to, I guess, increase the price of oil to better fit the monetary debasement that's been going on. Um, maybe under a Bitcoin standard, are they like producing way more and try, trying very hard to produce more? And do we, do we get maybe a glut of a lot more commodities and stuff like that because there's more trade what what do you, what do you think happens and how does the how does bitcoin sort of uh add more trust to this international um nation to nation interaction yeah so i would start off by describing think of each country almost mm -hmm. like an individual person where they have certain skill sets so like Jimmy, you might have a certain skill set. Let's just say programming. You're way better at programming than I'll ever be. Right. So that's, that's a competitive advantage for you versus a competitive advantage for me, which I don't have many skills. So, but let's just say I do. And, and you know, that's my competitive mode as a country. Right. So when you would look at these individual people like countries, Saudi Arabia, it's energy, uh, Russia, it's energy. Um, the US, it's technological, intellectual property and uh, like food. computers, food, like those types mm -hmm. of things. So each country has their niche. When you look at the erosion of trust and it breaking down, countries want to wield that, that advantage, that asset mm -hmm. around like a sword. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you're already seeing that in Russia and the, uh, Saudi Arabia, where they're like, all right, well, you want to pay us in these shrewd bucks. Well, we're just going to flex our muscle and we're going to, we're going to control the price of oil. And by doing that, which they have been doing, what has been the impact? We haven't seen it necessarily in prices, but where we have seen it is in the strategic petroleum reserve is it's been obliterated, right? Because we're trying to defend and battle back against that. If they keep pressing, before we can hit a recession and demand would disappear, it could literally cause the the treasury market to uh, get really scary and and be fractured maybe beyond re repair. And I think that that's really kind of the play that Russia and and other energy producers are, are maybe actually trying to induce right now. Um, mm -hmm. So I say all that because those are just like small examples. Every single country as this trust is breaking down and eroding is flexing their muscles through their assets that they control, which is their competitive moat of whatever good or service they produce. Hmm. The most, I would argue the most important one is energy simply because if you go to the base layer of everything that's being manufactured, it's pretty much energy, hmm. right? It is, it is the foundational input to, to everything. And it's because all of our tools are constructed on top of uh, mechanics that make our life easier and, and more uh, productive. Mm -hmm. So there was another question that you had in there. Uh, oh, so as Bitcoin introduces itself. So like, let's go to the other side of the, of the quote unquote event horizon. Mm -hmm. What you get when you have, and this is going to the, the Stephen Covey theme, the, the speed mm -hmm. of trust, right? If we are able to trust each other, that there's no way Jimmy can cheat anymore. And there's no way Preston can cheat anymore. What you actually get is this peak optimized efficiency between producers all around the world, whether it's, it's actual physical products or services. And so the volatility that you see in a lot of the prices really start to disappear. And what you get is a reduction in cost across everything for everybody. Now, this is really difficult for people to wrap their head around because they're still looking at the world through the dollar. And this goes to kind of something that Jeff Booth continues to repeat is if you're using the current system to view what the future system will look like, your optic won't work. It's like looking through a pair of broken glasses. You can't see it if you're looking at it through this old system. But I would just, I would, uh, let's put it this way. You're going to be able to work a whole lot less and have a whole lot more in your life under this type of standard, because that's just how efficiency works. Mm. 
Hmm. Well, uh, an interesting uh, uh, thought came to me while you were talking about all of that. Uh, the U.S. essentially wields the dollar as a way to sort of like manipulate other countries. And I think what you're saying is that they manipulate back by manipulating whatever commodity or good they, they have uh, sort of a, as a way to negate whatever manipulation uh, the U.S. has. Um, and that, that, that's a very interesting sort of like angle on financial war or um, trade war or whatever it is this ability to uh, manipulate your side to sort of gain an advantage. Yeah, uh, but the U.S. always has an advantage because they they control the uh, the currency, the the unit of account, the reserve that everyone uses for their trade. This this idea is is really simple but really profound. Mm -hmm. So when you debase your currency, it's like turning on a vacuum to suck in foreign currency. Okay, mm -hmm. think about uh, you hear people say all the time, "Oh, the dollar's really strong right now. Mm -hmm. I need to go to Europe." In, on a vacation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Think about it from Europe's standpoint. If their currency is weak, there's this natural uh, flow or vacuum sucking dollars into their country, mm -hmm. which then they can put on deposit as, as savings, which mm -hmm. boosts their GDP. And mm -hmm. so when nobody's on a peg, mm -hmm. what happens is, especially the net consumers, they are highly incentivized to debase, to basically attract physical things into their domain through that, that act of debasement. If you're a net producer in that arrangement, you want to try to sustain some type of peg to these, to these entities that are playing games to attract the physical commodities out of your country. Right. And that's the battle that's taking place right now. Um, yeah. And, and so uh, think about this, like, so when you look at some of these net producers, do I want to own Russian ruble? Do I want to own Chinese yuan? Mm -hmm. Nope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I sure as heck don't. And I think everybody else around the world would say the same thing because I don't trust those governments either with currency. And so anybody trying to make the argument that those that the the new currencies are going to be some kind of BRICS currency, I think is just uh, very naive and probably uh, somebody who actually doesn't understand Bitcoin as uh, the technology that it is to supplant that being a potential outcome. If Bitcoin didn't exist, maybe so. Maybe, maybe that's where this would be going. I, can you see a world where you get sort of like, you know, half the countries kind of doing one thing half the other because uh you know based on your thesis the the trust inherent within a particular group that that's the more important thing and if the nato countries or you know the western countries the net consuming countries sort of trust each other and they do they go in one direction and then maybe the BRICS countries or the producing countries like go in another then they can sort of have their own currency too and Maybe that's sort of like uh, an in-between step before hyper-Bitcoinization. I think you could see it in the short term. But mm -hmm. what, what any country that would try to exercise that with their, mm -hmm. with their uh, limitation, it would be a short-term uh, decision, almost like a business that would, uh, they have a competitive moat. Mm -hmm. As a result, they jack up their prices. And because they jacked up their prices because they had a competitive moat, they created five more competitors that show up in the coming years to mm -hmm. literally destroy their com their competition and and maybe destroy the the company completely. Mm -hmm. From a company from a country standpoint, it would be very similar. So any net producer has an advantage to get the world moving towards their their currency as a settlement mm -hmm. currency, mm -hmm. but by failing to acknowledge Bitcoin in this. Mm -hmm what they're going to do is they're going to attract other countries to, to try to compete with them on whatever that uh, competitive product is. That's, that's the, that takes the lion's share of GDP for that country. Hmm. Okay. So you would see a very similar thing play out. The faster they move to a, to a Bitcoin standard where they're settling in Bitcoin, the, the faster they're, they're incentivizing uh, that country to, to not try to compete in that particular space. Hmm. 
Yeah, so there, there is uh, an incentive to move towards something that's more neutral instead of uh, something Absolutely. that can get manipulated. Um, all right, so let, let's uh, step back just a little bit because we, we are in a world that is, I guess, getting more violent because of this lack of trust and so on. Uh, and, you know, if we had a better settlement layer, obviously there would be more trust and uh, things wouldn't get to the point where they have now. Um, but like, how, how do you see this transition happening from one to the other? Because we're, we're kind of in a situation where, uh, you know, a lot of countries, frankly, don't trust each other. Um, there, there are these two large groups, like, and, you know, they, they kind of need each other because the, the producers and consumers are on, you know, two sides of the divide. Um, it's possible that there's a World War Three, and maybe that's how it resolves itself. But I'm hoping for better solutions than that. What, what, what do you think, Preston? I look at the future through a race, mm. right? I don't look at the future as being defined as this is what I think is going to happen. Um, I would describe it as on the far left array, you have a very physical, violent uh, transition. I would say on the far right array, you have a, a very uh, somewhat swift transition to a, a, a new settlement layer, and it results in way less violence. Uh, it's still going to be... Um, uh, a lot of volatility in that transition, but it's it's not as violent as it could be. So what is what is driving the the probabilities for these future arrays being mm -hmm. one versus the other, uh, and and then a whole vector of multitude in between? And what it is, I I would describe as the key leaders in the most dominant countries around the world. So who's ever leading China, who's ever leading Russia, who's ever leading the EU, the UK, Japan, the US, those big countries. If, if you have leadership inside of these organizations that are seeking, that are looking at the world from how can I harness technology so that we can avoid as much pain as possible and move to a, to a better new system that is going to be to the, to the far right array. Mm -hmm. If we have leaders collectively on a net basis of all the countries that I just named that are looking at the world of I've been aft, I want to seek retribution mm -hmm. and I am, I cannot stand this counterparty and what they've done to my nation. And this is my moment to really show them. If the net consciousness of that group, of those key leaders, and, and those key leaders can change, you know, I'm here in the U.S., we could have a new president in the, in the coming year, right? Like, uh, in, in, in these other locations, things can change. So that's why it's near impossible to say, Jimmy, this is what I think is going to happen, because I don't know what's going to happen. All I can kind of, all I can do is define the left and right bound, and then I can define the variables that will affect probabilities as we move through this. And what I can say is for you, for me, for anybody listening to this, the number one thing we can do to try to impact that array is education, mm -hmm. educating as, as much as we possibly can to, to look at the world through a very positive lens ourselves because that has a mirror effect with every single person we interact with and how they then go on to educate as we continue to be pushed through this funnel of time and whatever the hell pops out the other side, mm -hmm. right? So uh, mm -hmm. those countries and those people in leadership positions inside of those countries are going to have to try to, <laughs> they're going to have to get this if we, if we truly do want to try to sidestep violence and uh, transition through the, all of this in a peaceful way. Yeah, I, I was just thinking as you were saying that, that, uh, that a lot of the nationalist uh, sort of like isolationist almost uh, sentiments uh, in a lot of these countries is basically a lot of people recognizing that they're getting screwed on the deals that, that their leaders are kind of making for them. And in a sense, um, you know, that, that is almost... Uh, almost like a, a, a drawing in of uh, 
uh, of where they are from from sort of like the lack of trust in international trade and that's that's sort of causing that movement to happen and it's obviously happening all over the place um yet in a, in a sense i i feel like a lot of those people don't really want war it's it's really the the people in power that seem to be like kind of pushing it which which is interesting because um you know according to your thesis it's it's a lot of um the the people that want violence are the ones that are more concerned with getting justice for how they've been screwed in some way or something like that. It, it's it's that, and it's also mm. violence is is uh, is big business, especially here in the U.S. It mm. is big business. Uh, when we look at the Department of Defense spending. I mean, you're you have to be seven, eight hundred billion dollars. I haven't looked at the number recently, but it, I would say it's at least that. And when you look at how much we bring in in, in tax revenues, uh, our tax revenues are uh, it, it makes up a, a significant portion of the tax revenues is the the funding of defense. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at how uh, politically popular that is, all of that money is getting voted into certain districts, mm -hmm. right? Like these people that that sit on the defense defense committees and the security councils and those types of things, one of the first things they want to know when they go over to the Pentagon and are talking to people at, at DOD is where what are the districts where this work is being done? It's truly what mm. districts is Lockheed working in to build this plane, and mm. what district is and uh, how much longer is this is this airplane going to be in production? 80% of that bill comes from, you know, the long tail of like after it's been manufactured. A lot of people think it's in the R&D side. It's not. That's like 20% of the bill. After it's been manufactured, just the, the sustainment, the operational and sustainment of that is 80% of the bill. And if you can put that work into your district, uh, you're going to continue to get reelected, right? Because that's a lot of money that you're flowing into that, to that region. So when we look at how like politics are structured inside the U.S., you have to take a very close look at how uh, defense spending is allocated into various regions. And don't be surprised when you look there, those people never leave office. They're always there. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that that's only in addition to what we're talking about with all the other incentives that uh, incentivize violence. Well, I mean, a, a lot of those people would like war because obviously it's better for their district. You get more money sort of thrown your way. So in a sense, they sort of accelerate any desire for physical violence uh, further because they, they have a financial incentive. Don't you find it interesting mm. that we're there in Afghanistan for all these years and don't mm. ask anybody what the objective was after like year two or three? <laughs> OK, don't mm -hmm. do it because because you won't find an answer other than to spend money and line the pockets of defense contractors. OK, mm -hmm. um, so when we look at that and we look at when it stopped and they're pulling out and there's people falling off the planes, the horrific act of like the and just the abomination of how they got out of there. Mm -hmm. Wasn't it interesting that that the Ukraine war kicks off within months after this mm -hmm. is over? Mm -hmm. And now, now the, the, the fire hose of fiat printing is now just pointed at a different location in the world, but it's still pouring into the pockets of like all these elective officials, the, the regions to develop these weapon systems, uh, of all these elected officials. Isn't that kind of interesting? Well, right? yeah, and, and, yeah. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't put the two together, but yeah. We, within you... months. Yeah, within months, and then they're sort of setting up for the next one because Ukraine seems to be sort of stalling out. And now, isn't that like, interesting that, that yeah. the Speaker of the House just left mm -hmm. because the uh, because of the funding at Ukraine was was mm -hmm. being hotly debated? We were going to go into a government shutdown. Mm -hmm. uh, the House Speaker is, is is removed from from the Republicans because. Mm -hmm he went against what they were trying to promote, which was to not allow more funding to go into Ukraine. And within a couple days, now all of a sudden there's another hotbed location that that's, that's popping off that now we're going to point the Fiat uh, defense spigot at mm. to, to 
make more weapon systems. I, mm. I'm not saying that it's that it's a correlation. I'm just saying, isn't that interesting? Mm. Well, I mean, I I, I, I don't know. I, mean, it, I don't know. <laughs> I don't the, know. The, I, the all I can do is just, spending. All yeah, I can right. do is is talk about how I I just can't wrap my head around how like these all these things are happening within days or months of each other, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and and it's uh it's always sort of like a almost like a new enemy. Um, they 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 seem to almost pick fights or something like that, and and there's uh, obviously enough. Um, you know, theft and stealing to go around. So you can, having you can experienced war, having experienced war myself, mm -hmm. let me tell you, it is horrific mm -hmm. and nobody wins. Mm -hmm. Nobody wins in this. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have to focus on building a better future through cooperative engagements with each other. That's a win-win for both parties, okay? And not, I crush you and I take everything you got. Mm -hmm. And if you did me wrong, I'm gonna annihilate you. Because in a world like that, it's just nothing but pain. Nobody, there's no abundance in that world, mm -hmm. okay? So I don't have a political opinion as to whether this war is good or that war is good or it's all bad. Mm -hmm. All of it's bad. We need to figure out a way to have a technology that allows us to not be at each other's throats because we don't have to trust that nobody's debasing the ledger is how mm. I would define all of this. Mm. Yeah, it, it's, uh, yeah, every, everything seems to be um, set up for significantly more um, violence uh, in, the, in the coming months or years. Um, Okay, so we we talked about Bitcoin, we talked about violence, we talked about stealing, um, and uh, we we've talked a little bit about the international order and stuff. Um, I I want to get a little bit into the specifics because uh, you you were in the army and so on. Uh, what what what's going on in the Middle East? Um, there's like all of this, all of these ships that are being sent over there and. Um, maybe even plane I, I think aircraft carriers with planes on them and stuff like that what like why would you do that as a government if you're not actively a part of that war why 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 are they going there uh why, why is the u.s going there when it's like a war between israel and palestine as trust continues to erode mm -hmm. just like if you're out on the street and you're with some of your buddies and then mm -hmm. you get bumped right mm -hmm. and things escalate People choose sides and then they form groups to, to uh, project force, hmm. right? If you're walking with three of your friends and some guy bumps into your shoulder and he was walking with four friends, what happens immediately? The, it's, it's a consolidation of power hmm. to project power and then who's ever in charge of that situation has to decide, are, are we going to physically implement violence? Or are we going to walk away and be productive and not let our egos get in the way of, of our response? And I'm not saying that either side here has any type of ego. I'm just generically describing how humans, human nature is to, to pick a side, defend that side, and, uh, you know, depending on who's actually in charge, and I think there's a whole lot of debate and discussion that could go down that path of like, who's actually calling the shots here, um, is, is something that I'm not going to, uh, put an opinion on. Cause I don't know. Hmm. Um, and I think it's actually more dangerous for me to think I know than hmm. to, um, uh, say any, any side or the other, but that's human nature. Hmm. So there's some egos that that are um, sort of like backing each other up or something like that, and that this is part of the show of force. Is what there's you're there's ego, there's retribution, there's all these there's all these emotional things because from a logical standpoint, hmm. uh, logic suggests that that you don't want physical violence, you don't hmm. want to see people get killed over things, right? Of course hmm. not. That's just logic. Um, 
but retribution if if somebody would kill somebody in your family or do whatever of course you're uh, it's 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 understandable that humans react in the way that they do sometimes to the the to the action that they had taken against them and um i my opinion is worthless when it comes to cuz the the history of all of the a person who's who's interjecting their opinion on any of this mm-hmm. is in my opinion uh failing to acknowledge their total lack of understanding of history mm. there's no way you can understand the nuance of cultural interactions when you haven't actually a been there b experienced it for yourself and c to think that you can actually speak on behalf of a collective culture is is laughable and and in all of this i don't i don't know hmm. and i think it's way more powerful to say that than anything that you pontificate about hmm. well there there's certainly a lot of money going into this and it's uh that 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 part i think we can be absolutely sure that you know on all the sides of this stuff um they they play with a lot of the money um one of the things that I'm always sort of optimistic about with Bitcoin is that if you if you have war on a Bitcoin standard, it's generally going to be limited because the government can't print their way into more war. Um, and as you were saying, there's a lot of ego involved with war. Um, you know, people just kind of want to win rather than be productive almost. Um uh, how do you see uh, that playing out here? Uh, is anyone going to run out of money? Because in, in a sense, like at least with the Ukraine-Russia conflict, that, that that seems to have been the main sort of strategy on both sides is let's bankrupt the other guy, right? Like and uh, o- almost more than let's go kill people, it's let's go bankrupt the other guy. Well, it's let's bankrupt their logistics, uh-huh. It's really the play, right? And and that could be taken in any kind of d- direction. But mm-hmm. like uh, treasuries are like you can do QE, you can do all these types of fancy things. But at the end of the day, uh, what humans actually need are commodities and physical things to put into their gas tank or put into whatever. So if you control that, that's the ultimate flex mm-hmm. of... Uh, the, the back and forth between uh, think, think of it like in a physical fight between two groups. So like mm-hmm. fiat is like the, the things that you can mouth off to the other side mm-hmm. and the muscles in somebody's arm is, and they're, you know, I watched Ben out at uh, Pacific Bitcoin, a wrestler. <laughs> ben Askren. Yeah. Oh my God, man. Holy, you talk about like proof of, I, I told him, I was like, it's not proof of work. It's proof of pain. Uh-huh. That would be commodities in the world right now is like Ben's like physical, like strength to just like do whatever he he wants, because that's the that's the real uh, that's the real indicator of proof of work. Hmm. Right. Hmm. Rather than the fiat money and just sort of it's all uh, mouth. It's all talk. Okay, so bankrupting their uh, commodities or their production or their. Uh, logistics, I guess, is is a more. This is the problem. This is the problem, Jimmy. Mm-hmm. We are so globally connected mm. as a human race right now that I guarantee you, there's a bottleneck in almost every one of these countries that if they actually decide to like choke off a, a, another country for a specific reason, it could wreak havoc for a lot of countries, mm. especially the smaller ones, right? And what we're talking about is 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 elephants kind of bumping around and all these elephants are highly dependent on technology i mean you could just go into the the chips right like look at look at taiwan and look at go upstream of of making the chips and the lithog the lithography machines that Mm -hmm. basically are doing these four nanometer chips and things like that there's only one company that owns the ip on this to build one machine it's a hundred uh what is it? A hundred million dollars just to build mm-hmm. one lithography machine. Mm-hmm. And there's one company making it, mm-hmm. right? Could you imagine what havoc that could wreck? Mm-hmm. So like we, our society has become so complex with the technologies that we have and so intertwined that 
like my message to all these global leaders is knock it off. Like, come on. <laughs> Do you really want to, uh, you know, go down? Like we only got so many hours on this planet, Jimmy. Do you want to spend those hours like literally ripping down a building or do you want to spend those hours building a building? Mm. Like that's what we're really up against here. And we just got to, we got to. We, we, gotta we gotta seem headed the... towards more uh, building destroying things than uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, than than anything else, and uh, it, it's kind of a sad state of the world. But uh, I mean, it it kind of feels like peak fiat at this point. Uh, would you yeah, say we're getting that there. that's the case? Right? I think we're getting there, and and okay. it, and right now feels a whole lot like uh, the fall of 2019 to me mm. personally, in uh, terms of like like we're all sort of waiting for the big thing to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I'll, I'll tell you fall 2019, like looking at the credit markets, looking at like what was happening in, in the financial markets, like it was looking like this behemoth that they had been like, uh, keeping up since the 2008 crisis was about to topple. And then mm. COVID happened, which mm -hmm. was kind of interesting. Right. Uh, I, I kind of see a, a very similar dynamic happening with credit markets right now in the fall of uh, 2023 as I did uh, back in 2019. So something needs to happen. And uh, yeah. this this might be an, whatever happens next might be a nice cover for what's about to happen. They need a narrative, right? Mm. Yeah, indeed. Very interesting. Very interesting. Well, uh, Preston, it's, uh, it's already been an hour, so I, I, I don't want to yeah, like this was sort of like a last minute podcast. Anyway, I don't want to keep you too long. But uh, what what uh, where can people find you? Anything that you want to promote that you want to talk about? Yeah, so I have a podcast every Wednesday. It's in this uh, feed called We Study Billionaires. We might have to change it to Quintillionaires here pretty soon because <laughs> uh, everybody's going to be a billionaire at some point in dollar terms. Um, yeah, so that comes out every Wednesday, and I, I talk about Bitcoin every Wednesday on that on that feed. And then I'm also active on Twitter, so just my handle, Preston Pish, on Twitter. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jimmy. All right, where's the stop? Uh